Hi guys, Philip Starrett here, and today I'm going to be talking about item potency and its importance and its key role plays within enterprise integration. So I'm going to kick this off with some discussion and then I'm going to show you some code examples. So the code examples are going to include Apache Camel and plain Java using a timestamp validation. So yeah, how can a consumer handle, handle duplicate messages? So first, to get this context sorted, the easiest thing to say is, you know, what is item potency and what is item potent? Well, it's actually used in maths to describe a function that produces the same result if it's applied to itself. So in relation to messaging and business systems, that really means if a, if a system consumes a message, it'll have the same effect on the system if it's received once or if it's received two, three, four, five or multiple times. So the question is why do we need to be item potent? Well the consuming application may receive the system more than once so depending on your in, in your integration pattern or your integration technology you may actually receive the message twice even if the publisher puts it on the queue maybe once or maybe the publisher has a bug and he sends it in twice or it's actually a common design pattern that the publisher will send duplicate messages and that's to do with error handling. So you need to be prepared as a consumer to basically filter out and eliminate them duplicate messages. So the bottom line is design your consumer so can, can safely consume the same message, identical message, the duplicate message, multiple times. So the easiest way is to me to show you an example so in the publishing system, there's an event. Someone has, has sold something. So that creates an event in the system. The publisher then needs to send that to its recipient list. It sends the message to consumer A. That's fine. So it received the message. Consumer A has processed that. It then sends it to consumer B. But unfortunately, there was a network failure or whatever reason, and the message did not get to consumer B. The publisher then continued processing and sent the message to all the other consumers that are interested and subscribe to that event. Well, because we failed when we were sending it to B, well, the publisher picked that up and said, okay, let's retry that event. Let's resend that to all of our consumers. So guess what? Consumer A received the duplicate message again. So now it's got two, it's received the same message twice. Consumer B now gets the message because the network failures resolve. So that's the first and original message. And all the other consumers who successfully received it receive a duplicate. So the initial thoughts are, that's a problem. You know, consumer A has received it multiple times. Consumer, all the other consumers have received it multiple times. You know, how do they cope with that? Well, is it really a problem? Well, it's not really a problem if they're item potent. So they can, they can set up their systems to filter out them duplicates. So they can identify early on in their process and say, this is a duplicate. We do not want to process this within our business logic and update our tables. So we'll simply log it as a duplicate and we'll store that somewhere else. And then we'll continue on processing other messages. Or it can actually depend on the, on the, the business logic, how you can filter that message. So instead of filtering the message, if the business logic is implemented to actually say set the balance to 50 pounds instead of update the balance to by 50 pounds then you could actually play that message through the system again as its actual value and what it's changing it's not changing anything it's setting values it's not updating them so again this really depends on your system and how it implements the business logic but if you're doing that you need to make sure that you now consider message ordering as you don't want to overwrite new data with stale data. For example, if you receive the first message, it comes in, you set an account balance to 50 pounds, and then another message comes in in between the resend, and it sets it to 100 pounds. Well, when the duplicate comes in again, it's going to overwrite that back to 50, so now you have stale data. So now you need to consider message ordering. So it really depends on the system, but you want to identify and filter duplicates and not process them or process them if the system allows it and it makes sense, it has to be pragmatic. But you have to be careful 
So, in the world we live in, we don't all live in greenfield development. There's lots of legacy systems, legacy processes out there, and not all of them are right and potent. So you need to make sure that you don't send duplicates to legacy integrations or systems that may not be able to deal with that, and especially, of course, if they deal with anything sensitive, like a financial or billing data, you certainly don't want a consumer or your actual clients being billed twice. But any new development efforts should definitely be out impotent unless they've got a good reason not to be. And what I would actually consider doing is going looking for them legacy processes that aren't out impotent and actually try and implement some out impotency on front of their integration. That would go uh, that would be a huge benefit with it within the, the ecosystem. So let's get a bit deeper here. So consumers should consider item potency at a granular granular level. And what I mean by that is per transactional resource. And I'll show you a bit more in the next slide and what I mean by that. And you should what you should do is provide compensating transactions if rollbacks required. So that's a compensating transaction for your transactional resource that we're going to go through. And of course, transaction ordering is important. You know, and, and you want to be able to use backwards recovery, forwards recovery, and save points. Again, I'll show you this in the next slide. It's easier for me to, to talk about this. Eventually consistent, yeah, you know, you may not be consistent now, but you will be consistent at some point in the future. And again, you need to consider if your system is a point in time system, so it has to maintain all, every single record of history on a certain um, subject, so an account or a contract or something along the lines or a person, any detail, any change, you need to maintain all that history then you need to also consider that. And of course, I'm throwing in their concurrency control as that should always be there. And some key points, define your error and exception handling strategy upfront and early on in the process. So what I mean by that is you want to identify and reject your duplicate messages or invalid messages at the start of the process. And you want to fail fast. So the last thing you want to do is get right through the system, right to the end, do all the business logic, all the computation, everything, and then figure out that it's a duplicate. You want to reverse that, put the, put the duplicate check right at the front, feel fast. And of course, you don't want to overwrite up-to-date data with steel data. So what I meant was earlier I said I'd impotency a transactional resource, and I talked about compensating transactions and backwards and forwards recovery. Well, in this example here, you can see that there's an event going on. We then have our consumer. So this is we've consumed the event that the publisher sent. Well, we now have we now have to update two databases and a message queue. Well, in step one, the first step we do is we have a, an Oracle database. This is the first transaction. And then in step two, once the first one's complete, we then update DB2. And the third, we, we sit, put a message on a queue. And as you see, the, they're specifically ordered this way. The queues last, as once you put a message on a queue, um, it'd be very hard or it could be hard for the ecosystem to roll that back if you're going to send a message saying undo what we've just done. So you want to put the hardest thing to revert last. So in this example, we're going to play the message in. It comes through. It successfully updates the Oracle database. Number two comes in, successfully um, puts the message, sorry, uh, updates the DB2 database. And the third message comes in and it fails to connect to the queue manager. So it throws an exception. And we do at this stage, we don't have we don't need to roll back these because we have a save point at step two. So basically it'll come in the error processor and come back through, and our consumer will retry that message as it's a recoverable exception in this case. And now it's gonna put it's gonna do step one again, but because we're at impotent, it's not gonna actually gonna update the database again. And then it applies step two. And because we're item potent again, it doesn't update that. And by the time it gets to step three, uh, we've been able to connect our queue manager and put the message on the queue. So now we've, we've resolved the system by making sure we're item potent at a transactional resource. So this is just one strategy if you can do this. I've used it before and it works very well. I quite enjoy it. And another example is a backwards recovery or forwards recovery. So if we have a consumer and we have our save point after step one, step one works, step two works, and then step three fails again because of the queue manager. 
Well, after step three fails, what we want to do is provide a compensating transaction to roll back the database. So we're going to go and undo, or not roll back, but rather undo our transaction operation. And once we've undone that, it then goes in the error processor and says we're recoverable again. The consumer then comes in and says, okay, step one, we're at impotent, we've done that. And step two, it applies the operation again, it works. Step three applies the operation and it works. And we continue. So the bottom line is here, steps are independent and each one is item potent. We want to provide compensating transactions if we need to undo or, or roll back. And we want to order them in, in the most, in the hardest thing to revert last. And of course, you want to only trigger uh, support if absolutely necessary. So what I like to put in here is a, a retry interval and a retry attempt. So we want to have, say, a maximum of five retry attempts. And in between each attempt, we would have, say, one minute, then two minutes, then four minutes, then eight minutes, and build it up incrementally. And then we could be able to retry that manually, say, from a, from a UI after that, if it continually fails. So moving on, publishers, if your consumers are item potent, yeah, your publisher, you don't need to worry about resending duplicate messages because your consumers can deal with them and handle them. So that's great for publishers because now you don't have to worry about individual consumers and just making sure you send to the consumer who had the exception. So it's a very common design pattern. I've seen this a lot. But again, be careful with legacy integrations and existing non-item potent processes. So if, if you're a publisher and you have, or you have a microservice and you're emitting events and you have subscribers, when, when, when a new subscriber comes along, you want to just make sure and say, you need to consider item potency, our, our handling solution, and we're going to be sending duplicate messages if we encounter exceptions. So we want you to be able to put a process in place to say, okay, this is a, a, a duplicate message and this is how we filter it out. This is how we log it and this is how we monitor it. And I, I think there's a, it's a very rare case that a consumer actually has a real case for not implementing the item potency. That would only be in a extreme uh, situation. But that's my opinion. And now I want to show you some item potency code demos. So I'm going to use Apache Camel and I'm going to show you a memory item potent repository, which you can use when you're running locally as it's going to be in, in your in your main memory. And then we could use uh, multi-node, multi-thread environments. So we could use the likes of JDBC item potent repository or any of other variations of the implementations of the item potent repository by Camel. And also I want to show you the timestamp validation. So we could use uh, locking and, uh, and some checking there using, using timestamps. And of course the message would have to have a timestamp to do that. And talk to you yeah, time of check to time of use. We don't want to fall into that bug. So all my resources here, there's a f definitely great resources already existing on, on this on this topic. So Enterprise Integration Patterns, I have to give a shout out to Gregor. Uh, it's a fantastic book, uh, I've read it. And uh, gay, up, up the guys in the camel, a fantastic framework. And all of the Microsoft uh, blogs. So I'm not actually going to code in this example, but I'm going to link you to another of my YouTube videos where I'm going to go over the coding examples. So we have the clear separation between the theory and the code. So if you enjoyed this content, subscribe to my channel and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much.